Today's title of the homily is Via Dolorosa. Tourist or pilgrim, rise up and walk. Today is Palm Sunday, or as some call it, Passion Sunday. After a long time since the imposition of ashes on Ash Wednesday, we are nearing Good Friday. And at last, Easter. I'm tired. It's been a long journey, but there are still some events occurring later this week before Easter. The Last Supper, the long walk to the hill of Golgotha where Jesus would be nailed to the cross and his agonizing death. I will be reading sections of Matthew's Gospel from chapter 27. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified! Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around them. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. After twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Aha! King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And then they had, after they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He's trusting God. Let him deliver him now if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama kamani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. I was supposed to be able to visit the Holy Land twice in my own religious seeker's journey. I got to walk the Via Dolorosa, the Road of Sorrows, with my group of fellow tourist pilgrims. It inspired me to write my musings in poetry. One of them fits this week very well. Here's a little background. My favorite visit was to the humble dwelling of the Christian peacekeepers, an interdenominational group of volunteers who live in Hebron, the home of the graves of the patriarchs and matriarchs. Ostensibly, the Jews ceded this small town to the Palestinians, but many Jews have occupied it against the legal agreement and have been supported by the Israeli government. Their self-appointed staff Paris was to accompany Palestinian children to and from school each day, to prevent them from being insulted and attacked by the illegal occupiers. The visit was deeply moving, and I was tempted to just stay there and share their simple lives, but nature called. I needed to pee, so they pointed me to their accommodations. Here is a picture. Looking at the primitive facilities, I faltered, not quite knowing how I, several months before much needed knee surgery, was to do my business without support and without falling in. Suddenly, living there, I lost a bit of its glamour. It prompted me to write the following poem. Pancakes and water closets. Did I want my ubiquitous and unavoidable falafel inside or next to my pita and bread for lunch? And if I can find a water closet, can I get up from a spot without a handrail or a call for help? After only a week here in the Holy Land, part pilgrim, part tourist, the tourist wins out for now. 
I just want pancakes for breakfast and a toilet seat. It's not too much to ask. It was a legitimate question. Everywhere I went, I was surrounded by other visitors from around the world. Ken was clicking, money exchanging hands. So it was a question I had to keep asking myself as I followed my own group leaders like a lost puppy. There were different little sidewalk vendors everywhere, some even coming up to me, sticking their products right under my nose. As the journey began, and I trod upon the same stones Jesus had walked, carrying my camera instead of a heavy cross, my mood deepened, and time and space disappeared. I suddenly realized that it was my journey to, not hopefully, and be crucified on a dusty hill on the outskirts of Jerusalem, surrounded by a crowd gathered only to watch my suffering and agonizing death. But I was a follower of Jesus, and I did not know then, nor do I know now, where that might actually take me. So humbly and eagerly, 2,000 years later, I followed in the steps of Jesus, not as a tourist, but as a pilgrim. Here's a picture of the entrance to this journey. As I reflected this week on Jesus' journey, celebrated in churches around the world, it occurred to me that we do not do that just to memorialize Jesus' tortured walk. But to realize that if we are true followers of Jesus, we must walk our own walk. Maybe, hopefully, it will not end in a dusty hill being nailed to a cross, but if we truly follow him, we must be willing to put our own lives on the line whenever we need to speak truth to power. I am co-authoring a book with a daughter in spirit who lives in Kenya. So I have been absolutely immersing myself in Kenyan history, literature, and in the lives of outstanding Kenyans who are and have been opposing the continued dictatorial regimes of fellow Kenyans after the British left in 1963. The first one who came to mind was Wangari Maathai. She is most known for starting the Green Belt Movement to reforest Kenya whose trees had been decimated, first by the British and then by Kenyan presidents in order to pursue wealth and power. The first one is, she is holding a seedling grown in one of the many nurseries around Kenya by villages in their own well-maintained nurseries. The next one is, holding a sapling which is ready to be planted in the forest to grow on its own. And lastly, here she is hugging a tree that the villagers had nurtured, now big enough and strong enough to do its part to explore, store the canopy of the forest around it. But I was born in Kenya in 1940 and came to the United States to St. Scholastica College in Atchison, Kansas the birthplace of another adventurer, Amelia Earhart, for her college education. When she finally returned to Kenya, she saw firsthand what the corrupt government had continued to do to the forest. They had kept selling off trees for the lumber trade, building large buildings on land that had been set aside for use. The uh, buildings, uh, the land was being degraded, crops were failing, water tables running dry. So she stepped forward, one person initially, and by trial and error, created the Guild Green Belt Movement, relying mostly on the labor and love of women in their small villages. At the height of the movement, these people, peasants, mostly illiterate, had planted more than 30 million trees. You heard me, 30 million, not 3 million, not 300,000, not 30,000, not even 3,000, 30, 30 million. She and her organization virtually reforested Kenya. She was summoned by many other countries to come teach them how to reclaim their own forests. Three cheers!
would be that it were that simple, but it wasn't. You can see this in the newspaper here. There was growing opposition from the government for bringing to light their illegitimate and money-grabbing plans for illegal and harmful development in public lands put her in the spotlight. They tried everything they could to stop her. She was arrested too many times to count, beaten, thrown in prison. She ended up going into hiding and through a growing network of friends of the Greenbelt movement was taken from home to home to hide from the authorities. At one point, she cut off most of her hair and dressed as a nun when she absolutely had to go to a meeting to which she had not been invited. I believe her own Via Dolorosa moment came at the showdown at Corora Forest, a nature preserve where they had nurseries for seedlings that was supposed to be protected from development. Nagari Mathai won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 because she walked the walk, especially on a January morning in 1999, when she strode into the Corona Forest, Nairobi's flagship preserve, to plant trees to protest government-approved plans to build a private golf course on the protected land there. Hired thugs attacked and brutally beat Mathai and her supporters. Police failed to ask. Film of the bloodshed outraged Kenya and the world and ultimately helped oust the corrupt authoritarian, pro business, anti environmental, anti environmental government of Daniel Moy. When the police showed up dressed in full riot gear, she insisted on signing a complaint against police brutality. They handed her a paper to be signed to make it official. She signed it with her own blood. Mathai passed away in 2011. Were she alive today, she could not legally organize a public pretending demonstration to publicize Kawara's death by a thousand cuts. Kenyatta's government recently passed laws banning public protests, muzzling the media. And now the new president is working to pass new legislation that will hamstring international NGOs potentially shutting down their environmental studies and activities. In her final chapter of her biography, Unbowed, appropriately titled, Rise Up and Walk. Throughout my life, I have never stopped to strategize about my next steps. I always just keep walking along through whatever door opens. I have been on a journey, and this journey has never stopped. When the journey is acknowledged and sustained by those I work with, they are a source of inspiration, energy, and encouragement. They are the reasons I keep walking, and will keep walking as long as my knees hold out. And she did, until her earth from ovarian cancer in 2011. Here's a photo of two young people, years later, in a part she saved, jumping for joy. For myself, I will keep walking, arthritic knees notwithstanding. But like these young people, because I've never even heard of a thigh, I will continue to try as best I can to rise up and walk for justice and hope. How about you?